Why Rue McClanahan didn't have a funeral? Rue McClanahan was born Eddie Rue McClanahan on February 21, 1934, in Healdton, Oklahoma, a small town in the southern part of the state. Raised in a deeply religious household, Rue was the daughter of Dreda Rue Nell, a beautician, and William Edwin. Bill McClanahan, a building contractor. From an early age, Rue exhibited a passion for the arts, particularly in dance and theater. She grew up during the Great Depression, which instilled in her a sense of resilience and resourcefulness. Her early experiences in this tight-knit community influenced her strong work ethic and her ability to connect with people from all walks of life. Rue's education played a significant role in shaping her future career. She attended Artmore High School, where she excelled academically and participated in various extracurricular activities, including the school's drama club. After graduating, she went on to attend the University of Tulsa, where she earned a bachelor's degree in German and theater arts. While in college, Rue honed her acting skills, performing in numerous stage productions. Her love for the theater was evident, and it was clear to those around her that she was destined for a career in the performing arts. Upon graduating, Rue moved to New York City in the late 1950s to pursue her dreams, where she immersed herself in the vibrant world of off-Broadway theater. Her early years in New York were marked by a series of small but significant roles that helped her build her reputation as a talented and dedicated actress. Rue's big break came in the 1970s when she was cast as Vivian Harmon, the scatterbrained neighbor of Maude Findlay on the hit television series Maude, which starred B. Arthur. This role catapulted her into the national spotlight and showcased her incredible comedic timing. Her portrayal of Vivian was beloved by audiences, and it was clear that Rue had a natural talent for comedy. This success led to her being cast in another iconic role, Aunt Fran Crowley, on the popular sitcom Mama's Family in the early 1980s. However, it was her role as Blanche Devereaux on the beloved television series The Golden Girls that would forever cement her legacy in the annals of television history. The Golden Girls, which aired from 1985 to 1992, was a groundbreaking show that followed the lives of four older women living together in Miami. Rue's portrayal of the vivacious and flirtatious Blanche Devereaux was nothing short of iconic. Her character was unapologetically confident embracing her sexuality and independence in a way that was revolutionary for television at the time. Rue's performance was a masterclass in comedic acting, blending charm, wit, and vulnerability. Blanche Devereaux quickly became a fan favorite, and Rue won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series in 1987. The show's success and critical acclaim ensured that Rue's place in television history was secure. After the Golden Girls, Rue continued to work in television and film, appearing in various guest roles and made-for-TV movies. She reprised her role as Blanche in the short-lived spin-off series The Golden Palace, and made appearances on shows like Touched by an Angel and Law and Order. In addition to her work on screen, Rue was an accomplished stage actress, returning to her roots in theater throughout her career. She appeared in numerous stage productions, including The Women in Wicked, where she played Madame Morrible on the national tour. Rue's versatility as an actress allowed her to transition seamlessly between television, film, and theater, showcasing her incredible range and talent. Rue McClanahan's personal life was as colorful as the character she portrayed. She was married six times, often joking that she was a serial bride. Despite the ups and downs of her personal life, Rue remained a resilient and optimistic individual. She was also a passionate advocate for causes close to her heart. Rue was a staunch animal rights activist, working with organizations like PETA to promote the humane treatment of animals. She was also a breast cancer survivor, having been diagnosed in 1997, and she used her experience to raise awareness about the disease, encouraging women to get regular screenings and advocating for better health care for cancer patients. It was announced on January 14, 2010, by Entertainment Tonight that, while recovering from surgery, she had suffered a minor stroke. In March 2010, fellow Golden Girls cast member Betty White reported on The Ellen DeGeneres Show that McClanahan was doing well and that her speech had returned to normal. McClanahan died on June 3, 2010, at age 76, at New York Presbyterian Hospital after she suffered a brain hemorrhage. 
After cremation, her ashes were given to her family. Her death marked the end of an era, as she was the third of the Golden Girls cast to pass away, leaving Betty White as the sole surviving member at the time. Rue's legacy, however, continues to live on through her work. She left behind a body of work that has brought joy and laughter to millions of people around the world. The Golden Girls remains a cultural touchstone, with new generations discovering the show and falling in love with Blanche Devereaux. Rue's influence on television, particularly in the portrayal of older women as vibrant, complex, and fully realized characters, cannot be overstated. Her performances have inspired countless actors, and her work continues to be celebrated and appreciated by fans old and new. Despite her fame and the affection with which she was held by millions of fans, no traditional funeral service was held for McClanahan. This decision, though seemingly unconventional, was in line with her personal wishes and reflected the unique and private nature of her life off-screen. McClanahan's family chose to honor her memory in a manner that resonated with her love of simplicity and her deep connection to her fans. Instead of a formal funeral, they created an official memorial page on Facebook, allowing admirers from around the world to share their condolences, memories, and tributes. This digital space provided a platform for fans to express their grief and celebrate McClanahan's life in a way that transcended geographical boundaries. The use of social media for such a purpose was a relatively new phenomenon at the time, highlighting the evolving ways in which people were beginning to mourn and remember loved ones in the digital age. In addition to the online memorial, McClanahan's family arranged for two memorial services to be held during the summer of 2010, one in New York and the other in Los Angeles. These cities were significant to McClanahan's life and career, as New York had been her home for many years and Los Angeles was where much of her work in television had taken place. The services were intimate gatherings, allowing close friends, family, and colleagues to come together and remember the vibrant spirit of the woman who had brought so much joy to audiences through her performances. The choice not to hold a public funeral also reflected McClanahan's desire to avoid the often overwhelming media attention that can accompany such events, particularly for someone of her stature. By opting for private memorials and an online tribute, her family ensured that her passing was marked in a way that was both respectful of her wishes and considerate of the feelings of those who knew and loved her best. Shortly after her passing, on June 10, 2010, McClanahan's New York apartment was put on the market with an asking price of $2.25 million. The apartment, located on East 56th Street in Manhattan, was a reflection of her eclectic and sophisticated style, filled with memories of a life well-lived. The sale of her home marked the end of an era, as it was a place where she had spent many years and where she had created a sanctuary away from the spotlight. The decision to sell the apartment was likely a practical one, but it also symbolized the closing of a chapter in the life of a woman who had been a beloved figure in American entertainment for decades. In the absence of a traditional funeral, the sale of her apartment, the online memorial, and the private services in New York and Los Angeles all served as ways to commemorate Rue McClanahan's life and legacy. These choices reflected her family's understanding of who she was, a woman who, despite her fame, valued privacy and preferred to be remembered through the warmth of her performances and the connections she made with people, rather than through a grand public spectacle. In the end, Rue McClanahan was celebrated in a manner that was as unique and thoughtful as the woman herself.